Greetings everybody and welcome back to the Manifold series. Today in video number three, we're taking a look at atlases. So in the previous video, what exactly did we do? We took a look at charts. So that's roughly described what a chart is to get started. So you start with a very abstract topological manifold. And what a chart does is it gives a small region in your very abstract topological manifold. Let's say this region or this chart domain here, gives it some coordinates. So you define some kinds of chart map, which associates every single point in that domain to a concrete yeah, list of numbers in Euclidean space. Now this is something we should be able to do for the whole entire manifold. You cover different regions in different coordinate systems and whatsoever. And that's essentially what an atlas is because charts only cover a small region. You want to be able to do this for every single region on your topological manifold until you kind of cover the whole entire thing. And that's exactly what an atlas in, yeah, in real life is. So an atlas of the earth, you have a bunch of these pages and each of these pages represents a portion of the earth as a two-dimensional image and or the whole entire stack of pages that constitutes an atlas. And well, in order for this thing to be an atlas of the Earth, it should be able to cover the whole entire Earth. So what I mean by that is, well, as you can see, sometimes these charts might overlap a little bit. What you want to be able to do if you pull out all the pages of your atlas and you stick them together where these charts overlap, you should be able to reconstruct some kinds of yeah, paper model of the Earth in yeah, some wrinkly, funny way. So an atlas, usually we give it the symbol curly A here. I believe on LaTeX this is the math SCR font for yeah, the capital letter A. This is just going to be the set of a bunch of charts. So we have chart index, let's say UI, comma, XI. So these guys are charts here. Um, and your eyes can really come from any index sets you want. So it's just a collection of charts. And you have to require that if you take the union over yeah, I in the index set of these chart domains here, UI, you should be able to recover your whole entire manifold M. And that's exactly an atlas. It gives you all the charts that you might need in order to describe some kinds of topological manifold. So let's take a look at an example. I'll just take circle as an example because it's you know, fairly simple, I guess. So example, we have S1, which is the circle. So the circle I'll draw somewhere over here. So there's our yeah, topological manifold circle thing. And now we want to start covering the circle in charts because of course this guy isn't homeomorphic to you know, any sort of Euclidean space. This is dim dimension of circle equals one. So we want to be able to find homeomorphisms to yeah, part of one dimensional Euclidean space or just yeah, parts of the real number line. So in order to do that, we need to take a look at neighborhoods of the circle. So the whole circle isn't homeomorphic to the real line. So the next best thing you could do, I guess, is if you remove a point over here, let's say P, so I choose some points over here, I remove that point, and then we can construct some kind of chart domain using that. So let's say we have a chart domain that looks something like this. So this is the chart domain that I'm going to be calling U, and I define this chart just to be S1, but I take out this point P here, like so. And so this is my chart domain. And now I need to define a map that takes me from this chart domain to part of one dimensional space. That's not too tricky to do. There's yeah, many, many different ways to do this, but I guess I'll just choose something over here. Let's take, a, let's say we have a chart map that takes, let's say this points roughly, takes this point to the number zero on the real number line. Maybe it takes the point up over here and takes it to the point, um, yeah, pi on two and it maybe takes this point over here to somewhere over here and you can do some similar things down here as well and it's going to map to the interval um yeah pi and then down here it's going to be negative pi so we have a map that takes us from part of the circle an open subset of the circle to a part of yeah one dimensional euclidean space and you might recognize this as yeah polar coordinates in some way you can think about it like that but really you're just giving a number to each point on this yeah subset of the circle and of course you can't take the whole entire circle because if you're trying to map it to the interval negative pi to pi you have to yeah, rip it apart which isn't continuous but if you exclude this point here then you can yeah, do it continuously it's also bijective so we have defined a map which I'll call X here and that's going to be a chart map that's associated to this chart domain U here so this is an example of a chart we just constructed and now we want to make an atlas on this circle this chart only covers a part of the circle because of course it misses the point P here. Oh no, so we need another chart to cover the, yeah, the point P there. Let's try to construct another chart. And to do that, I'm going to 
pick a point Q here that may lie on the opposite side of the circle, whatever that means. So in order to define another chart, we need a chart domain first of all. So let's take the circle once again. Now I'm going to take out Q instead. So this is the points Q that I take out. And now we need to find a map that takes us to a subset of one dimensional Euclidean space. So maybe I take, you know, let's say this point right over here, maybe I map this point to maybe down here, close to the number um, zero in some way, and then I might map um, this point here and up over here, maybe closer to the number two pi, and I might map the point, yeah, this point which was a P here. So this is the point P, I'm gonna map it directly to, yeah, pi, why not? And you want to do this for every single point on this chart domain, which I'll call V here. And V, what was it? This was S1, but I'm going to take out the point Q. We have our chart domain. We just defined a chart map, which I'll call Y, that takes us into a part of Euclidean space. So yeah, we've defined another chart. And now notice one nice thing here. If you take the union of U and V, this basically recovers the whole entire circle S1, which is quite nice. So we have two charts now that cover the whole entire manifold. So therefore we can form an atlas out of this. So observation, if you take the union of these two chart domains, it recovers the S1 here. So therefore we can define the atlas, let's say U comma X, V comma Y. And this guy is an atlas for the topological manifold S1. Now it turns out this is not just any ordinary atlas for our circle S1 here. We can do a little bit more investigation on this atlas. In particular, we can take a look at the chart transition map. So this is only two charts here, which is fairly simple. We can consider the chart transition maps. Let's see what those would be. So chart transition maps, I'll call them CTM for short. So yeah, chart transition maps, they work on the intersection of the two chart domains. So you may remember in the previous video, we had the diagram, we had U and V here, then we can map down two different ways. We can map down by the chart map X, or we can map down via the chart map Y into X of U intersect V, and then Y of U intersect V, and then the chart transition map just goes both ways between here, right? And what exactly are the chart transition maps? So it's the maps Y after X inverse, and also X after Y inverse if you decide to go back the other way. So let's try to figure out what the chart transition maps of this circle manifold would be. So if you take a look at the setup we have so far, what exactly is U intersect V? Well, U intersect V, that would just be, well, we have this chart domain which excludes the P here, and then we have this other chart domain which excludes Q. So if you intersects them together, U intersects V, that's just going to give you the circle S1, but you take out the points P as well as Q. So the chart transition map Y after X inverse, it starts from the image of, yeah, this U intersect V under the chart map X. What exactly is that going to be? Well, the chart map X maps the circle well, in this way here, and we want to map, well, what was it? Everything besides these two points. And if you take a look carefully, that's just going to be, well, the interval from negative negative pi to zero, yeah, open endpoints, and then zero up to pi. So what do we have here? We have a y after x inverse. This is going to be a map that takes you from negative pi to zero, union zero to pi, into the real numbers in some way. And what, how exactly does this work over here? So we have, let's say, some t number here. How exactly would we transition from the ux chart into the vy chart? Well, let's take a look over here. Notice that the point on this you know, upper half of the circle, well, it gets mapped to zero to pi, this interval zero to pi. And notice the same thing happens with this chart as well. The upper half of the circle gets mapped to the interval zero to pi. So you can check this a bit more carefully if you want to, but t gets mapped to t, but only if t is on the interval negative pi to zero. Now if you take a look on the interval negative pi to zero or negative pi to zero and um, that would be associated to the points on the lower half of the circle here. So on the chart map ux these points on the lower half get mapped to negative pi to zero but on this chart over here well what does it get mapped to? Well down over here it gets mapped to pi to two pi. So in particular you're going to add an extra 2 pi to yeah, whatever t value you have. So t gets mapped to t plus 2 pi, but only if negative pi is less than t is less than, yeah, zero, like so. So this is the chart transition map. And if you want, you can draw a little bit of a picture for this as well. So you can draw some axes if you want. So this is, uh, yeah, 
R to, well, not from R to R pretty much. So we have T to T on the interval zero to pi. That's basically the identity map. Um, so we have open circle, open circle, yeah, something like this over here. And then on the interval negative pi to zero, well, it's T, which would be down over here, but you translate it up by two pi. So you're gonna get something that looks like, yeah, this over here, if you start at negative pi and then go all the way up to zero. So this is the chart transition map y after x inverse. And you might notice, well, this map is you know, discontinuous, isn't it? That's a bit of a problem because aren't all chart transition maps supposed to be continuous? This is something we saw in the last video. Well, it doesn't really matter because we're only restricting to this interval here. And on exactly this interval, this map is continuous. So notice the map y after x inverse. This is a continuous map, and I won't do it in this video, but you can also check the map x after y inverse, so going back the other way. That's also going to be continuous. And these maps are, of course, bijective as well. So notice that y after x, this guy, is c0, and you also have that x after y inverse, this guy is also c0. So therefore what you can conclude from this is that u comma x and v comma y, these guys from, from the definitions I provided in the last video, these guys are going to be c0 compatible. And now notice because these are the only two charts in our atlas over here, because all the charts in our atlas are C0 compatible, we have some extra terminology. We say that the atlas is a C0 atlas, because all the charts in our atlas are C0 compatible. Now notice well, this is a C0 map, all right, but it's even more than C0. It's even differentiable. You can differentiate this guy. You can even differentiate twice if you want to, or infinitely many times, because you won't really run into any problems. So in fact, these two transition maps, these are more than just C0. They're also C infinity compatible. And because the chart transition maps in this atlas over here, they're C infinity compatible. That makes this atlas also a smooth atlas. So I'll put this in here, brackets, let's say. Also, a C infinity. Now, if it's C infinity, um, sometimes we call it smooth for short. So it is also called a smooth atlas. So as you can see, you can classify your atlases in different ways, depending on what the chart transition maps will look like. So let's give a bit more of a general definition here. So we can consider what's called CK atlases. And what exactly is a CK atlas? Well, it's an atlas that only contains CK compatible charts. And we know exactly what CK compatible charts means. It just means that the chart transition maps are CK. And now the final thing we're gonna take a look at in this video is the notion of a maximal atlas. So as you can see in the circle example, we had an atlas which only contains two charts. Well, that's fine, it covers the whole entire circle, it's an atlas. But are these the only two charts we wish to have access to on our circle to describe our circle? Well, no, we could add more charts in. We might want to describe our circle in a different way. Let's say instead of using radians, I wish to describe points in the circle using yeah, an x value if you wish to embed this in the Cartesian plane in some way. There's many different ways to describe the circles. So inside of this atlas over here, you might as well throw all the charts that you wish to use inside of that as long as they are compatible. So we have a maximal atlas. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be starting with a maximal C0 atlas. So what is a maximal C0 atlas? Well, it's just an atlas which contains every single possible chart that's C0 compatible pretty much. But every single chart is C0 compatible with any other charts. So the maximal C0 atlas, which I'll probably call yeah, A0 maximal down here. This is just, just the set of all the charts you may wish to have on a manifold. So every single possible chart you can think of. This, right, so you can think about the maximal C0 atlas as some kinds of sets here. So maybe I'll, I'll draw this guy. This is A0 maximal. It's a set of all these charts inside of here. But now sometimes you don't just want a maximal C0 atlas, you might want your charts to work nicely together at the level of, let's say, k times differentiability, in which case you might want to see k atlas. Let's just start with a C1 atlas, for instance. So let's say on the circle, we can find a C1 atlas. Let's say this guy over here, this is some kind of C1 atlas, so I'll call this A1 here. Now this is simply just an atlas, an ordinary atlas that contains yeah, C1 compatible charts. 
And now you may wish to add to this atlas a little bit, so he finds other charts, right? So maybe this chart and this chart and that chart, and he finds all the charts that are compatible with this A1 here. Now each time you add a new chart, you have to make sure it's compatible with all the existing charts. It's not enough just to check it with one chart because chart compatibility isn't quite an equivalence relation. The transitive property doesn't quite hold all the time. So each time you add a new chart, then you better check it is compatible with all the other existing charts and you keep adding more and more charts until you can't add any more in. And then essentially what you get is this new atlas over here. It's still an atlas, but it contains all the charts that are C1 compatible with each other. And this gives you now a maximal C1 atlas. And the maximal C1 atlas is of course going to be on a subset of the maximal C0 atlas because you're only taking a look at specific charts. Now what could happen now is if you have, well, this is the set of all your atlases once again, this is the maximal C0 atlas. Now what could happen is if you have one atlas at let's say this is an atlas over here, it's not a maximal atlas yet, it's just some atlas, and then you might have another C1 atlas over here, so this is another atlas. You could try extend both of these guys to their maximal atlas, so you could keep adding more and more charts into one of these until you can't add no more, and you keep adding more and more charts into the other one until you can't add no more. It might turn out that these two atlases over here might lie inside of the exact same C1 atlas, and this is exactly why we consider maximal atlases, because you might have two different atlases, but if you extend them out to their maximal atlas and they lie within the same maximal atlas, well, they're really the same thing to begin with anyways because it's describing the manifold in basically the same way. So every, say, C1 atlas you might have, you can extend it to a maximal C1 atlas, and you can do this for any order. You could do it for, yeah, CK order as well. And it might turn out that these two atlases, when you extend them out, it turns out they lie in completely different maximal atlas, which means that these two guys aren't even compatible with each other. And this is where we might have to stop and say, well, these two different ways of describing the manifolds, these might be different. And the question of whether or not they are really different, you have to take a look at different morphisms and different structures in more detail. I might make another video on that in the future, but it's not something we have to worry about too much now. But yeah, the main idea is we're always going to be considering maximal atlases from now on because we just simply want access to all the charts. So inside of a maximal C0 atlas, you might be able to find a maximal C1 atlas. This guy would be A1 max, and if you want a C2 atlas, well, first of all, it has to be inside of one of these A1 maximal atlases, so you might be able to find a C2 atlas somewhere, hiding somewhere in over here as well. And if you want a C infinity atlas, well, you have to keep zooming in more and more and more. And yeah, that's essentially the idea of what we're going to finish off now with the maximal CK atlas, which is where you just start off with some CK atlas, and then you keep adding more and more charts, and you have to make sure the charts, they're all CK compatible. You keep adding more and more charts in until you can't add any more, and that's going to be the maximal CK atlas. And we'll finish off here for today. Right, so that's basically all for this video on atlases. So just a recap of what we did today. Atlases, they're just a set of charts that cover the whole entire manifold. You might want to classify your atlases in different ways by taking a look at the properties of the chart transition map. So if the chart transition maps are all CK, then you call your atlas a CK atlas. And usually what we do once we have an atlas is we extend it up to a maximal atlas by putting every single chart we might wish to have in there. And it isn't really too clear why we might want to have all of this stuff yet, but it will be made very clear in the next video once we try to define differentiability. This is exactly why we need these atlases over here. So that's all for this video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed and yeah, I'll see everyone in the next video. Bye bye.